Bitbugs are oval and flat. They're reddish brown in color, and the adults are up to about 10 millimeters long. The eggs are very tiny, only about 1 millimeter long, white in color, and quite difficult to see unless they're all clumped together. They're wingless insects, so they won't be able to fly or jump, but they can crawl and for a very long distance too, up to 20 feet, to obtain a blood meal, preferably from a human. Unlike mosquitoes, bedbugs undergo incomplete metamorphosis, so they don't have larvae or pupae. The, e the eggs are ha hatch into nymphs, and they're very similar to cockroaches actually, and they molt. There are five molting stages before they become adults, and this takes about six weeks long. The lifespan of an adult bedbug can be anywhere from four months to a year. Females may lay up to 200 eggs, and both male and females bite, which is unfortunate because we don't want to spend time with bedbugs in bed and have both genders biting us. They bite mainly at night, and after feeding, they will crawl back to their hiding places to digest the meal. Bedbugs can actually starve for up to six months, by which time they'll be very hungry and really looking for humans to bite and get blood from. To date, they're not known to be biological vectors of disease. They inject their saliva when biting, and this causes itching, but it's pretty limited as a skin reaction. You can see that when they bite, there is a cluster pattern and generally is a group of three in a line, sometimes known as breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Very rarely, there may be severe allergic reactions to these bites. And using antihistamines and antiseptic inflammatory creams is usually sufficient to soothe these bites and reduce the inflammation. Bedbugs are generally found worldwide, as they may travel in suitcases, and they're not, unlike some common thinking, they're not due to lack of hygiene. So you could be scrupulously clean, shower every single day, and still end up with bed bugs. They're found in cracks and crevices, in walls, behind loose wallpaper, in mattresses, bed frames, and furniture. And because they can crawl for such long distances, they can actually travel from one apartment to another, along the pipes and electrical wiring. They tend to be found more commonly in places with high turnover of occupants, for example in hotels or hostels, and in short-term housing. I have a link here that is the bedbug registry. Um, it's mainly in North America, and you'll find that if the link still exists, Toronto is actually one of the hotspots for bedbugs, as well as New York City. So it's really where there are a lot of people. Um, that's where bedbugs tend to be found. To monitor for bedbugs, check furniture, such as beds, using flashlights. Look for small brownish black spots or streaks, and look for live or dead bedbugs. You can actually dislodge bedbugs out of the seams by scraping along them. You can use something flat, such as a knife, that's a, a blunt knife, or even a credit card. Gaps in baseboards are also hiding places for them, so it's, it's worth looking for them in baseboards and looking for gaps to see if there are any. And also walls and face plates that are covering light switches. And also picture frames sometimes. Other signs of bed bugs are blood stains on sheets and mattresses as they bite and then they might cause bleeding, especially when people are sleeping at night and unaware that they've been bitten. There may be also excrement flax near hiding places, a little bit like the cockroach frass. And there can also be insect bites on the body as a sign. There may be presence of live insects. They are the size of apple seeds and also this sort of the same shape. And also uh, look for the tiny eggs that might be glued to surfaces. 
These are some pictures that were taken by Rhonda Berger, who used to be our old head of department. He was also um, a public health inspector for a very long period of time and with Toronto Public Health and led the bed bug um, program. Um, I really, really wanted him to come and give us a talk because this is from one of his lectures uh, at a sci-fi meeting. Actually, this was at the uh, Public Health Ontario Environmental Health uh, Division. But unfortunately, he passed away um, a couple of years ago. Bed bugs can be controlled by several IPM strategies. You can use physical control, sanitation, habitat alteration, and exclusion. So I've lumped them all together. Furniture should be steam clean, especially mattresses. And crevices and seams should be cleaned with vacuums by vacuum cleaning um, using a nozzle attachment. As soon as you finish cleaning, the bags should be sealed up and disposed as soon as possible. Any bed linens should be washed in the hot wash cycle with hot water and then dried using the hot cycle. Um, it doesn't save energy, but it will kill the bed bugs. Items should be discarded if they're not valuable. And any crevices and gaps should be sealed. I think I mentioned that before. And just as with um, cockroaches, clutter should be removed. With bedbug infested furniture, usually these should be thrown out. However, before they are removed from the, the home, they should be taken apart so that it cannot be used again. So mattresses should be slashed and they should be wrapped in plastic to stop the bed bugs from escaping. Also, they should be tagged with a sign that says do not take and put out shortly before trash collection to prevent anyone from using them again as a secondhand item. Chemical control is usually used for bed bugs. Pest control operators should be hired to carry out the spraying. Make sure that they are licensed. Bed bugs are getting more resistant to pyrethrins and pyrethroids, and it's getting more difficult to eliminate them using these types of insecticides. So alternatives are desiccants like boric acid, or the salt borax, or pesticide grade diatomaceous earth, which is not as fine as the type used for water filters, and thus likely to cause silicosis. Other alternatives include dichlorous pest strips, neem oil, a natural product from the neem tree, insect growth regulators such as methoprin, and neonicotinoids, which act on the insect nervous system. However, neonicotinoids may be banned soon because they are toxic to bees and other pollinators. The effectiveness of chemical control depends on quite a number of factors. The first one is the scale of infestation. Obviously, if there is heavy infestation, it is much more difficult to eliminate and you might have to spray a second time. Um, the thoroughness of the pretreatment preparation is also important, so all beds should be clean and linen laundered before chemical sprays are used. And this is important in a uh, housing situation, especially if it's in a, an apartment block where residents should be told that uh, the spraying is going to happen, but they should then try and clean uh, their beds and also launder the linens before the spraying uh, comes around. Um, the quality and coverage of the pesticide application is also important. Depends which pesticides are being used, especially if the bed bugs have become resistant to that particular pesticide in that area. And the chemicals should ideally target all the life stages of bed bugs. I have placed two links here at the bottom of the slide. The top one is from the American Environmental Protection Agency. This is a search tool for pesticides that are effective against bed bugs. However, not all of the pesticides are available in Canada. Um, so I've actually put a second link at the bottom.
for pesticides that are available in Canada. And you can have a look at them to see which bed bug pesticides are actually available and also allowed to be used in Canada. So because we've had so many problems with bed bug control and because of the resistance to some of the sprays and the pesticides, it is always better, as with everything else too in public health, to prevent the infestation from occurring in the first place. So how do we keep bed bug free? You might think that the first thing to do is to get out of the bedroom, leave the house, and get away from it all. And maybe the bed bugs will die. Uh, they can survive for six months. So the best thing is to actually stay in place, stay put, and to monitor. Monitor to see whether after the spraying and chemical control, whether there are any bed bugs that have survived. Then you should completely seal the bed, including the, the box spring, not just the mattress, in what are called encasements. These are plastic casings that have zips on them um, that will completely seal the item of furniture. You can also protect the legs of the beds, that is if the beds do have um, legs, or some of them have bed frames with a um, wheelie, uh, a wheel at the bottom. So uh, with those, you can actually put double-sided tape on them or glass jars with petroleum jelly or baby powder. Uh, this is to really stop the bed bugs from crawling up and down uh, the legs. And you can also use these devices called interceptors, which are um, almost look like plastic dishes, but they have a channel uh, around the rim, uh, which actually prevents bed bugs from climbing up the legs. They usually try and get in uh, from cracks and crevices in the wall, crawl along the floor, and then they get, uh, that's why they call it interceptors. They get stopped by these interceptors and fall into the outer rim of the dish and are prevented from climbing up into the bed. Um, headboards and beds are also not a good idea if you have a bed bug infestation. So they should be removed to prevent any more bed bugs from hiding there. Um, it's also good to use metal or plastic furniture as opposed to um, soft furnishing and wooden furniture. Also white sheets and white bed frames are a good idea because they will allow the bed bugs to be spotted more easily. And to make sure that um, when you vacuum, um, to dispose of the bag immediately so that the bed bugs don't crawl out and cause a, an infestation to start all over again. So you may wonder how bed bugs actually get into homes. Well, as I mentioned before, they like to travel and they can travel and hitchhike in suitcases. And so if you've been to an area where there is a heavy bed bug infestation and stayed in a, a hotel that's infested without you knowing it, it's very important to use these travel tips to prevent bringing bed bugs home. Use light colored plastic suitcases. This is as opposed to dark colored cloth ones, which are really common. Uh, it's generally less common to see these light colored plastic suitcases, uh, especially when you go to the airport and you're collecting all your luggage. You don't normally see many of these, um, but these are good. And the reason for that is because you can spot the bed bugs very quickly. Plastic suitcases also don't allow bed bugs to hide anywhere, so they can't really hitch a ride that easily. As soon as you get into the hotel room, put your bags in the bathroom or actually in the bathtub. Make sure that um, it actually has a tiled floor if you're going to leave them on the bathroom floor. And look at the hotel bed and luggage racks. Um, see if there are any signs of bed bugs. Do not unpack the, any clothing. Keep the clothing in the bags and do not store anything, especially shoes, under the bed. And this is really difficult to do, especially if you're going to be there for a while. Um, most of us 
if we're going to be staying in the hotel for maybe more than three days, we'll start unpacking our clothing uh, and put our shoes under the bed. But this is obviously not a good thing to do if there are bed bugs there. If you find any bed bugs, you should inform the proprietor. So when you return home, there are also things to do to prevent bringing bed bugs inside your house. And that is to check your luggage very carefully before bringing them inside. This is something that might be difficult to do in the middle of winter. Um, so unpack your clothing away from the bedroom. Generally, the advice is to unpack them outside your house. If you have a front porch, that might be a good place to do it. Um, otherwise, your neighbors might think something weird is going on. Um, any clothing or fabric items that you've used away when you're away, um, wash them in hot water. And any non-washable items should be steam cleaned or dried in the hot cycle. You can also vacuum your luggage and to ensure that there are no bed bugs sticking around and discard the bag immediately and wash all the brush and nozzle attachments for, your, for the vacuum cleaner in hot water with detergent. Because bed bugs were such a huge problem in Toronto, the Toronto Public Health decided to start a bed bug team and there was one between 2011 and 2012. Actually, it carried on for a little while because um, funding was actually available. The group consisted of six public health inspectors, three public health nurses, and one manager, of whom uh, was Rhonda Berger. There were more than 1,500 bed bug service requests and more than 4,500 unit assessments. This is public health inspectors going in to investigate infestations. More than 1,250 units had bed bug infestations, and more than 150 required extreme cleaning, coordinated by the Toronto Public Health bed bug team. So you can see that we really do have, and did have quite a serious bed bug problem in Toronto, and we still do. Uh, in fact, one of the lectures had to be stopped uh, because a bed bug was found crawling on one of the students' backpacks uh, that was in the Vic building. So not sure if it came from, you know, the student's home. Unlikely. It probably came from one of the um, the benches or the seats in um, the Vic building because, you know, the Vic building is pretty old. Um, and it's also uh, used to be open to public access uh, all day and all night. Um, the bedbug team also held educational sessions and more than 2,500 people attended. 